Welcome everyone, I'm Sandra McIntyre. We're glad to have you here for our session today on a digital library for everyone, designing for collaboration and innovation. Uh, we've got a, a number of presenters who will be doing different things with you today, quite a nice variety of things. And I'd like to take a moment for everyone to introduce him or herself before we get started. I'll start, I'm Sandra McIntyre. I work for the Mountain West Digital Library, which is a program of the Utah Academic Library Consortium. Looks like this slide got messed up. Um, and um, it's uh, the Utah Academic Library Consortium is a consortial effort among Utah, Nevada, and Idaho academic libraries. And the Mountain West Digital Library is one of its signature programs. And we'll learn more about Mountain West Digital Library later. And next. Uh, my name is Cheryl Walters. I'm head of digital initiatives at Utah State University. And let me just say that for those of us who came from the West Coast this morning, 7 o'clock came awful early. <laughs> yeah, I'm super tired. Uh, <laughs> My name's Nate Hill. Uh, I'm here from San Jose. I'm a web librarian at the San Jose Public Library. Um, yeah. Hey. Uh, I'm Michael Lascarides. I am uh, senior manager for web initiatives for the New York Public Library. Um, and I'll say that there are lots of people at NYPL working on different aspects of this. I'm going to stay to the domain that I am familiar with, which is uh, audience and user experience and delivery of materials. Um, that's my standard disclaimer. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Toby Greenwalt. I'm the virtual services coordinator for the Skokie Public Library. We're just north of Chicago. And um, I think you know, in the, the public library world, this is a concept that's not on a lot of people's radar. But I think for it to work, it's going to require a much greater critical mass, and so I'm hoping to, you know, get what I can here and spread it out to the, to the masses. Hi, I'm Jefferson Bailey, uh, formerly Digital Projects Coordinator, Brooklyn Public Library, and hang on recently hang on. started at Library of Congress. Great, thanks everyone. So many of, many of us have just met each other in person for the first time today, although a number of us have known each other online, and of course we've worked together online to plan this variety of things for you today. So we're gonna start out with just a few slides setting a context about a digital library for everyone. What does this mean? Where are we headed? What are some of the questions that it raises? What's the potential? And then Cheryl Walters and I will do a, a presentation about a certain case study um, the Mount West Digital Library's experience over the last 10 years as we look at what it means to design for the content part of collaborative efforts and some of our ideas about what has worked and maybe what still needs to work. Um, and then Nate Hill will be giving a presentation on what a national digital library means for public libraries, giving that perspective. And he'll take us into some focus questions that we're offering today where the panel will reflect on some things that we think are interesting to reflect on, and then we invite your participation as well in answering, helping us to answer some of those questions. So a digital library for everyone. Well, we have a lot of large-scale national collaborations that are underway, some very significant ones. And we, want to, we are all starting to pay a lot of attention to those, wondering what it means for us and what we need to do as we scale up and get bigger and bigger. Many of you in the room have been involved in increasingly larger scale collaborations as you've worked on regional digital libraries or perhaps dis discipline specific digital libraries. But now we're starting to talk at a national level. And what does that mean and what is the potential for it? So some of the things that we've pulled out as maybe being part of that potential for discussion today are, first of all, of course, the idea of free and open access. We want to deliver that as librarians. What does that mean to give full access to as many people as possible? And how are they going to want to, uh, to receive that access? What are they going to want to do with it? So integrated discovery becomes a big part of this. How do we take that information overload potential problem? and turn it into something that's actually useful for people through giving them really good discovery tools. What do we do to preserve that cultural heritage for a lot longer time? We're seeing a lot of concern over disappearing digital resources. What, what can we do together at a national level on a preservation basis? And then how do we accommodate the diversity? The diversity 
of the resources themselves, all the formats, all the different kinds of content, subject matter, vocabularies that are involved, but also how do we deal with the diversity of the libraries, archives, and other memory institutions that are involved in coming together with their different needs, different perspectives on the materials, and how do we accommodate that diversity to make the richest environment possible? How do we make sure that things are curated with some of the issues that David Weinberger brought up earlier so that we're offering resources in a way that's not confusing to people um, so they know what, to, what we think of them or what they can think of, what they, what they can do with them? How do we plan for better interaction for people with the resources? What are people going to want to do? Remix, reuse, repurpose. How, are, how is that going to work? And then what kind of community are we building out of this? What sort of culture are we creating among ourselves as we do this com these common efforts and then more broadly among all of our different audiences? So, so there are two uh, big initiatives that are going on. One of them is Hadi Trust. Um, the other one uh, you heard a lot about this morning was DPLA. Can I just see a show of hands? Are there Hadi Trust members in the room? Okay. And how many people are interested in participating with DPLA? Wow, that's great. That's great. And some of you raised your hands for both efforts. That's good. Um, well, for those few of you that don't know what Hadi Trust is, it's an international community of research libraries that are committed to the long term curation and availability of the cultural record. Um, and we have almost 10, 10 million volumes uh, in that library. Uh, and, the, and we've made progress over several years. So there is a corpus of materials out there for people to use. On the other hand, we have DPLA, which is just beginning. Uh, but there are some similarities between the two efforts. Um, DPLA is an ambitious project to realize the great potential of the internet for the advancement of sharing information. So uh, that's, those are the two efforts that we have in mind as we're giving our presentation this morning about collaboration. So our focus today is going to be that we in the digital library community have learned a lot about collaboration and innovation in this last decade. Um, we've been building increasingly larger scale digital libraries um, and we'll be telling you a little bit about our own uh, collaborative, the Mount West Digital Library. But now we're, we're wondering what can we now apply from what we've learned over the last 10 years to the task at a national level? So, and as we were tossing ideas around for how to give what we should cover in this presentation, it, it occurred to us that there are actually two, two aspects of digital collaboration. And one is the back end, where you're bringing diverse partners and content to the collaborative steward, stewardship. So this is building the content. And then you have the front end, which is redesigning the tools and interfaces to meet the diverse needs of a broader audience. Uh, Sandra and I are going to be focusing more on the back end and Nate and his crew are going to be focusing a little more on the front end in our talks this morning. So as we look for designing for content collaboration and take a look at this case study of MWDL, we're looking at um, our, our search portal that we've created. It's a central search portal to dig digital resources from Universities, colleges, public libraries, museums, archives, historical societies, and actually we've been recently adding a large number of government agencies at all levels, municipal, county, um, service districts, as well as state uh, in the Mountain West. We've got a fairly large search portal at this point, 350 collections, 55 partnering organizations, uh, hosted on 18 regional hosting hubs, and a total of 600,000 records. And little just a quick little bit about us we had some good drivers for collaboration it was kind of collaborate or die in the Mountain West we are very isolated from both coasts 
Um, we have a lot of people who are you know, hundreds of miles from their next uh, uh, friendly face. And um, so working together became something we really wanted to do. Had a lot of economic drivers, as I'm sure many other regions of the country have had, for collaborating and squeezing the most we can out of scarce state dollars in our states. Uh, we realized quickly that a lot of us in our academic libraries were in the same boat and that we were all facing the same training challenges and the same technology infrastructure challenges. Fortunately, we, many of us in the academic world in the Mountain West had had a 30 plus year history of collaborating via the Utah Academic Library Consortium, which represents libraries not only in Utah, but also Nevada and Southern Idaho. And um, we were able to leverage that structure, that support, that collegiality to get started working together and to find ways to work across those, those many miles in lonely Utah. We've come up with something that I think is actually pretty astonishing, and it's diversity. And I know a lot of what you were working with, many of you, is you're starting to feel that too. Wow, it's amazing the different kinds of partners we're working with, and that just keeps getting more various. So we have a variety of different partners. We also have a variety of different formats, and we need to be able to represent those and think of what people might want to do with those and how the metadata accommodates a lot of interoperability among very different formats from different kinds of, of uses. So this, diverse, this diversity in our collaboration leads us to have to think a lot about how are we going to manage that and how do we make sure everyone's at the table and all of those resources are useful to people. And we want to talk a little bit more about some of the aspects of what we've ended up doing to manage that. And then a couple of questions about where we've seen that we need to maybe do some new things in our second decade. Um, so just in brief, before we go into the, a few more of the details, um, we have managed it through regional hubs to provide services to smaller cultural heritage institutions rather than trying to have it all be centrally managed. We have created a centralized harvester and search interface to optimize the aggregation of all of that into one place that's convenient for users. We have really focused on governance that allows local ownership and central discovery. Um, we have developed symbiotic partnerships with different funding agencies. We've made clear roles, responsibilities, and pricing. And we've right-sized with working groups to get it all done. So first, here's a little graphic representing our distributed network. We've got 18 now different regional hubs um, representing a wide number of repository types. We've got ContentDM and BPress and Archivalware and a lot of homegrown systems that had to make up their own OAI stream and stuff like that. So we have a real variety of, of hosting hubs uh, spread around our region so that they can then in turn turn around and provide hosting services and digitization services to smaller cultural heritage institutions, libraries, archives, historical societies, etc. Um, the, the hubs, these regional hubs, have taken on a lot of the burden recently in conducting the training and the technical support for those smaller organizations, and that's more about that in a minute. The hubs do the hosting. Uh, many of them provide digitization services. Um, they have a, a, a fee that they charge to the smaller partners for those services. They can also contract to do metadata assignment or parts of the metadata assignment. We usually like local partners to be really involved in their metadata, but there may be technical metadata or other kinds of customized subject assignments that can be done by the uh, folks at the regional hosting hub. And they provide the training and technical support. Despite that distributed network, which we view as a real strength, being able to spread it out, have it be scalable and flexible, we still, of course, need to aggregate all the information into a central index. And we're really pleased in recent months to have been able to go live with Ex Libris Primo uh, as our integrated discovery layer. And it seems to be performing pretty well for us now. Very robust harvesting, really quick about going out and getting all the information. Good faceting of results and did you mean suggestions for users. But still, when people come into our index and discover things that they want, the link goes back out to the regional hosting hub. So the, the resources are actually hosted 
close to home, mm -hmm. not in a central location. Just the metadata is harvested centrally. And I'm sure that's a model that's common for, for some organizations other than ours. So this leads to some governance implications for us. <clears throat> we like the collections to remain really owned at the local level. We want the people who were involved in collecting the photographs or who found the maps in some back office at the government offices um, to be the ones to work with local folks to assign metadata. Uh, we want those people to decide legal and copyright issues and to be sure to curate the collections through their lifetime. So um, that also gives us real advantages in terms of buy-in at the local level. We brand, and, uh, we brand all the local resources with the contributing partners, header and footer. Um, and we make sure that we have policies that are member driven mm -hmm. through our, our committee of hub representatives and anyone else who wants to be on it from our partner organizations. So this has led to kind of a balance, balancing act mm -hmm. between management, distributed management, and a centralized management. And we go back and forth about where the right balance is there. And striking that right balance can be difficult at times. Mm -hmm. um, but we like to think that it's an ongoing question that we ask, you know, what should be centralized? Some things you want to have centralized for efficiency reasons and other reasons. But a lot of things I think need to stay distributed. And I think that's been one of the strengths of our collaborative. We've maintained buy-in from a lot of people being involved at a more local level. Okay, uh, another um, kind of hallmark of our uh, consortium is that we've sought uh, a variety of funding mechanisms. And some of these have been, we've developed symbiotic relationships to existing funding sources like LSTA. Um, and most of the states, well, I think all of them have state historical records advisory boards. Well, we partnered with ours, and now when they go out and they, they uh, make a pitch to all the little cultural heritage institutions across the state, they recommend that instead of using grant money to purchase their own equipment, that they come instead to the regional hubs and they pay us to do the digitization for them. So um, it has been really beneficial to uh, develop those relationships. Um, also, we found it really critical to, as we got larger, that we needed to start to write things down and be more formal uh, about um, roles and re responsibilities, who is expected to do what. Um, and we also found it critical to develop a price list because knowing what each hub is going to charge and that they're not going to be undercutting each other and that there is this uh, predictable set of prices allows uh, small institutions who are seeking grants to write the grant up easily without contacting a regional hub to say, well, what would you charge me if you do X for me? Um, and then a third critical thing that we did that really has helped us um, to share our metadata better and create a better interface with facets and uh, other value-added aspects to it has been the creation of best practices. Um, this way we know that when a person is using the creator field, we're all using it for the same thing, and that we can build um, predictable search engines that will, will give consistent results across many uh, collection partners and collections. So uh, early on, when we were small, we used to all get together and make decisions, talk things out, and decide what we were going to do. But as we grew bigger, and this is going to be a big issue with DPLA and Hadi Trust, uh, we discovered that's not very efficient. Um, and so we spun off these working groups. And you'll see that this is, this, is a strategy that Hadi Trust and DPLA are already using. Um, that people with expertise or interest in a certain area will participate in a working group that focuses on that. And they can get a lot of work done offline, so to speak, and then report back to the entire committee. So you can have multiple initiatives going on at one time, uh, and it really helps you know, m move the group forward. Um, some of the working groups that we've had uh, have been metadata, 
um, outreach, portal design, web 2.0 tools, training, and digital preservation. But when, as we move on to the national level, um, we, we have some recommendations based on our, our experiences uh, at this in a smaller venue, and that is try to keep ownership at the local level, to spell it all out on paper, uh, to try to tie in with existing structures so that you're not duplicating efforts, um, and then make conscious decisions about where it's appropriate and most efficient to centralize versus decentralize, uh, and then right right-size the work team by breaking it up into appropriate groups and create a large umbrella with technology structure. You don't want everybody running around creating maybe uh, an individual digital preservation system. You know, let's uh, economize and, and build a big one that people can contribute to. Uh, and this is something that Hottie Trust has already done. So, uh, we're not finished, you know, we've just finished up our first 10 years and now we're moving into the next 10 years and so we have new issues we're exploring. Uh, we're looking to meet the needs of our partners across the life cycle of resources. We used to focus on just getting the stuff together, but now we're, we're starting to uh, plan for data curation and long-term preservation. And we're also interested in joining with other uh, collaboratives like the Northwest Digital Archive um, in Washington. Um, and we're interested in collaboratively developing digital collections. So, as an example, we have uh, a Japanese relocation center in Utah called, uh, it's located in Delta. And there are a lot of historical documents as a result in Utah that pertain to this Japanese American relocation center that occurred during World War II. So, instead of each uh, per each entity having their own little collection about these resources and then everyone having to go to place A, place B, place C. Now they can come to the Mount West Digital Library and we're hoping to build a topical search that'll say uh, Topaz Japanese American Relocation Center. You just click on that and it will seamlessly bring all those resources together into one corpus. Uh, and then finally, um, we want to make sure we're serving diverse user groups. As we add more institutions to our group, they're bringing in different needs, and we need to make sure we're meeting all those needs. And we want to explore collaborative training in digital collection management so everybody knows how to do their jobs and, and do it well. So uh, at this point, we're going to turn the conversation over to Nate, and he's going to talk about what a digi uh, national digital library means for public libraries. So um, I, I have to ask uh, to start things off, other than the panelists that we've got over here, is there anybody from public libraries in this room? Raise your hand. Come on. Not at all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, that's great. Now, it's really it's fun to be in a, um, in a different kind of room and talking to a different group of people about all of this stuff. Um, I'm excited to turn this into a conversation, and I, I want feedback, and I want you guys to be talking to me about all of this. Um, I'm going to run through a few different things. I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think the future of public libraries is and should be. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about user-generated content and how I'd like to see that work with the DPLA. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what perhaps a physical footprint for the DPLA might be, uh, because I don't believe that for public libraries it's really good enough for it to simply exist as like a big web thingy. Um, so, moving along. Um, just a, a little observation about uh, what the internet has done to things in libraries. Um, libraries traditionally are these kind of read-only facilities, right? They're a place where you go to consume knowledge. You would go and you, you, can, you can access books and you can read them there. Um, you, you can get your music, 
you can get your movies, whatever, but it's always, it's, it's a one-way relationship with certain exceptions, but that's basically the model that we've always worked on. Um, I would say that that's not good enough anymore. And I think that we're really only doing half of what we could be doing in public libraries. So there's a great opportunity. And this great opportunity comes at the same time that all of our content is going digital. So um, it, it's interesting to see that now, you know, since the, uh, since the Amazon Kindle deal, uh, ebook circulation has gone up like 250% or something like that at my uh, library. But at the same time, the door count is as crazy as ever. So what is up with that? What is up with the fact that all of our content is going digital? We're talking about digital public libraries of America, yet these buildings are jammed with people. Um, they're, doing, they're doing all kinds of different things in there. And so I think that <clears throat> what, we have to, uh, what we have to realize is that libraries are about more than just these, the consumption and collection of knowledge that's in them. It's about the other pieces. It's about the, the opportunity to produce knowledge in there as well. So the, the sort of most obvious example of that that you'll see in every single um, uh, public library is, is like a kid's craft program, right? <clears throat> that, that always happens. A lot of people are going in and turning them into Flickr slideshows and stuff like that now. But why does it stop with kids? Why when we have this sort of, of, of networked environment, when it's just as easy to, to write to a blog or anything like that, why, why do we leave it there? Why is it that like my friend's kid who like loves the internet um, doesn't know how to use something like Photoshop. What's up with that? Like, there, there's an opportunity here for libraries to move into a different space. And, and so uh, along comes the DPLA, um, which I, I think is just this wonderful, huge, ambitious project. But it's important to me as a public librarian that we steer it in a direction that makes sense for our users. Um, I think about this stuff more at the app level, more at the, at the user interface level. So I'm not going to be the guy who's going to provide the best argument for like distributed versus centralized or, or whatever. What I think about is my end users, is the people who come into the library, and what could this tool be that, that would be helpful to them? How could, how could it change the way that they learn, the way that they interact with, with each other, with information in general? Um, what, where is the added value for them? So one of the ways to kind of like back up and look at libraries is, is to sort of categorize things, right? And you can say that, indeed, every library in some way has a, has a collection associated with it. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, they're also about the conversations that go on be, uh, between people in there and, and, and the, the connections that you draw between different objects that are in there. Um, and, and finally, it's about context. It's about uh, librarians helping you figure out where this stuff fits into your life. What makes sense, what's good, what's bad. Um, and, and, and all of these things come together to form community. Am I with, is everybody with me so far? Am I like, all right, cool, good. <laughs> so um, there, there was this great moment at that DPLA plenary meeting um, a couple weeks ago. It was, a, the whole thing was, was, it was very historic and, and deep, you know, it was really deep. This, this quote here, it's to facilitate the discovery and exposure of digital content for permanent open public access for the enhancement of knowledge and community. Wow. Um, that's huge, but I, I just loved that the director of the Los Angeles Public Library got up in, in the middle of this thing and just kind of raised his hand and said, so what's in it for the kids? And yeah, I mean, the guy is totally right on. These are the people who, who come every day after school. They're working on their projects. I'm hanging out with them and, and dealing with their, uh, with their issues. So if we're starting to think about what the, D, the DPLA could really be, about apps that would be built on all of this, then you know those are users that you really have to consider. And I would argue that um, if we don't somehow incorporate user-generated content into this thing, we, we lose the sort of context that makes these people interested in it. Um, 
and, and it's interesting because this is going to get at some of the stuff that, uh, that uh, David was talking about earlier with, with inclusion and the content. And, um, you know, once we hit a point where, uh, where my kids at the library are uploading videos of like whatever their library activity was and relating it to trusted library content, what does that mean for the, for the academic folks who are using the same stuff out there? You need to have a way to filter down on that stuff. But at the end of the day, um, we've got the, the five elements that have been agreed upon with the DPLA. It's, it's about code, it's about metadata, content, tools, and services, and community. But I want to see all of that stuff channeled back around to create apps that inspire creativity in the community so that people can contribute back. And it can, again, be about the production of knowledge, not just the consumption of knowledge in the library. So I'm going to go to like a, sort of a, a use case study here. Um, this is a super popular program at the San Jose Public Library. Uh, it's the Battle of the Bands. Um, these kids love it. Like they, they wait all year for it and um, come out and basically uh, they, they rock out. So <clears throat> it's interesting that this is like one of the most popular things that goes on at the public library. And you know, it, it would almost be easy to dismiss it as ah, oh, whatever, it's just kids like rocking out. But no, this is like this is an important moment in their lives, and it, it gives them an opportunity to relate the the production of what they're doing to all of the other information that the library has accessible. So <clears throat> there are other points. So this is this is the performance aspect. But think of all the other sort of touch points along the way that the library could assist with this, and start to imagine where the DPLA might come into this. My buddy up the way works at the East Palo Alto Library, <clears throat> where he uh, got a grant to start lending guitars. Um, it's amazing. They, I don't know how he ever got a picture of them on the wall, because they're never there. They're always checked out. But, but what if you took the Battle of the Bands, and then you took it to the point, OK, we're going to provide the tools by which you do this. It's sort of like at the, at the Berkeley Public Library, they're lending out power tools. You can actually borrow things like that. Or you know, if you want to get digital with it, there are libraries that are lending out digital cameras and whatnot. So that's like so. So that's one other place that you could do it. But what what if we start to think about it with um you, you create with the guitar, right? And then you have your performance moment, and then and I know that Toby actually has an instance of this because uh, at his library they have a media lab, and there's audio production equipment in there. Another opportunity for for the library to assist in the creative process. And then, of course, you can share it out to the web. But then this last step is where I sort of start to get excited about the DPLA. When we can, and this gets into the curating that David was talking about earlier as well. Um, and actually, I am kind of talking about old school curating, not some of the deeper stuff he was talking about. So let me get, skip ahead. So <clears throat> all right, so here's these same kids in the bottom here. Um, playing their show. Say they've uploaded their video to the DPLA. And they realize that, you know, <clears throat> they're kind of into the goth thing. So they, discovered, uh, so they discovered a couple of old records that sort of make sense to their tastes, their music, right? Um, they find an old Cure record, they find a Susie and the Banshees record. But then, be, because they're able to build these collections inside of the app, they, they can start to take their tastes and relate to them to, to the other library quality works, as we were saying earlier. So, I mean, I'm remembering when I was a kid and there was a song by The Cure called Killing an Arab, which was a really controversial song, but it's because nobody really knew that it was actually about the stranger. Um, and it was what motivated me to actually read that book in the first place. Um, and that's kind of how kids' brains work, right? It, you take these strange pathways to, to understanding and what interests you. Um, in, the example, in the other example, you've got Susie and the Banshees who, uh, uh, who, who did her makeup very much like Cleopatra. And so it could be an easy uh, inroad to becoming interested in ancient Egyptian culture. So um, I think that there's a great opportunity with this sort of um, giant cultural heritage collection to build apps that, that really engage people um, through learning through curation. Um, I'm just going to show a couple of ones that I thought were super awesome from, from, the, uh, 
from the meeting the other day. Extramuros is, is a tool that does a, a lot of that. Um, and also, uh, David didn't even talk about Shelf Life, which is um, a really cool app that he, he developed with his team over at the uh, Harvard Library Innovation Lab. So finally, um, as I'm talking about all of this stuff with production, with content creation, um, I, I, I really do believe that there needs to be some kind of more serious framework for actually doing this on a regular basis in public libraries. Um, we have these disparate efforts. There are all these cool little media labs and things like that popping up all over the place. But we are talking about the network effect, right? We're talking about the, the, the age in which all of these things need to be kind of connected in another way. So um, I, I've been working with, oh, missed a slide. Super important. You have to make it fun. Whatever, whatever, uh, whatever apps are built on this thing, if it is not entertaining in some way, ain't nobody going to use it. Um, and I, I really hope people are thinking about that because um, there's a tendency to get kind of like dry and scholarly about this stuff. I'm, I'm going to make no friends saying things like that. Anyways, you know what I mean. Um, so getting back to the idea of, uh, of a space in which these activities happen, I was working with um, some architects, uh, Nolan Tam in Berkeley, and um, and uh, friend Sam from uh, the One Laptop Per Child project on uh, pulling together a modular set of, of architecture that can support each of these different types of activities. This will make more sense as I kind of just show you. Um, that probably won't show up very well. So the idea is that you can break down the production of knowledge into these 10 to 11 categories. Uh, examples being, um, say, you wanted a scanning unit. You had a, a particular scanning need in your library. Then you would be able to take and, from these designs, pull that into to your library program. All of the stuff is, is modular. It's, it's an open source architecture. It's, uh, it's printable at your local like fab lab. Um, and every single piece is built from a series of, I think it's 10 pieces that we've got there, um, based on, on a, a Penrose tile design. So you can have all of these different chunks and modules operating at different libraries across the country. And, and, and they can all contribute back to one source. So using the, uh, the example of the Battle of the Bands, I picked out a couple of the modules that would make the most sense. <clears throat> You'd need an audio remix and record setup. You would need a hardware checkout setup. And you might need a curation setup. Um, each of these things can scale depending on you know what what your budget is, how much space you have. It could be built you know it could be built from plate glass or it could be built from cardboard. It just depends on what your budget is. Um, and so right now we're in the process of sort of developing this further. What I'm showing you is like pretty pictures basically because we haven't taken it to the point of doing construction experiments, figuring out all of the connections and, and all of the all of the fun little details with this, but. Um, but it's coming. So that's my little piece on the, uh, the future of public libraries and, uh, and really knowledge production in public libraries and how that's part of what the DPLA needs to do. I think that is it. So uh, let's move on and get our panelists up here because I'm tired of talking. All right. Whoa. The uh, the first question we have here is for right arrow will work. Right arrow will do it. Okay, I got it. Uh, for Sandra, and the question is: How does a national digital library benefit diverse content partners? What is their motivation to contribute content? Yeah, and I think we'll just go off of this mic now rather than my lobby. Okay, yeah. great. Well. I'll just kick it off, and then I'd love to hear from others, too, about this. Um, you know, we, we felt like uh, 
we wanted to talk a little bit about why different partners would get involved and what's in it for them and how do we keep that diversity of different organizations being involved in bringing that wide variety of content. DPLA's got to think about that. Hadi Trust has got to think about that. What's in it for the content partners? What's their motivation? Because a lot of people, frankly, in the library world are kind of used to making their reputation on this is my special, special collection and I'd like to be known for our special collection and our curation efforts. And we'd like people to come to us to get it. Um, so do you, do you uh, work with saying, well, you'll be more famous by having your materials be accessible through DPLA and HathiTrust. People can see what, what you've done. And as long as we keep it branded that it was, that it was your work that put it up, does that work to motivate people? Are some people also maybe motivated by their interest in their users being able to experience the materials? So there's this kind of quid pro quo. I'll share my materials if you share your materials and we'll all have a richer experience for all of our audiences. So that kind of collaboration comes about too. But what else can we do to motivate people to actually go to the trouble that it, I mean, it takes some trouble to be interoperable in a DPLA it in the Hathi Trust. It takes some effort to take your collections and share them and maybe have to change a lot of metadata fields or do some complicated crosswalks to make sure that they happen. And what is motivating people? Do some of you have some ideas about how that works? How have you motivated people in collaborative efforts that you've worked in to bring that content to the table? That original primary source content is, of course, mostly what I'm talking about now. Ideas? Yeah. There's a microphone right here. Yeah, this is oh. being recorded, so. Yeah, here, I'll, I'll take the microphone, too. Here you go. Is it working? No? Here. This will work. I can just speak loudly. Here. Do, or, do, just use this one. There you go. Check, check. Nice. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, the motivation that um, occurred to me was a raised profile. Um, I mean, we know that so much content is siloed, even when it's all on the web and at least theoretically um, equally discoverable by Google. In practice, that doesn't really happen. People have their one place that they go. So, I mean, this is not exactly on motivation, but um, a lack of demotivation for content contributors would be, it, it, I think it's important for that content to remain branded by that li library or content provider. You know, you usually, Europeana actually does a really good job of this, where they, they sort of make it clear. You know, it's all sort of copies of it in Europeana, but then you, you know, you know where that thing came from and you can click through to their site, I think. So, um, so that. Uh, great, anybody, did, did you have a question as well? Here. It's fairly similar in some ways about um, having that, that connection and the interoperability. What jumped to my mind was when you mentioned the Topaz uh, relocation camp. We just mounted at, uh, I'm an archivist at, at UMass Boston, um, a set of oral history interviews by a, a, a professor at UMass who interviewed people who uh, survived uh, those camps, you know, who are still um, around and who have recorded their stories. So to pull those together is the motivation, you know, to have it all in one universe for then uh, you know, fastening and filtering and, and operating upon. Um, what I don't understand, which maybe about the end of these two days I'll understand more, is you know the direction of that kind of interoperability. What it means in terms of searching or the, the the DPLA, and also the linked open data concept. You know, the more dynamic or you know what really needs to be repository together and what uh, at how dynamic we can be about making those connections. But the motivation then is the, the pulling things together. Anybody want to speak to that? Yeah. I'm going to give this to you. I think there are two things that people don't want anymore, even in the Ivy League where I live. First of all, everybody understands nobody's got everything 
even on one topic. So the way you get everything is you put it online and it's interoperable. So nobody wants to be in the position of having only some. And nobody wants to be in the position of being the only one whose stuff is not out there. It used to be that you know the, the important thing was the gatekeeper. You can't come and look because you are not one of the anointed ones. But now it's, if you still have that, and that generation really has passed, I think, uh, even in the really stuffy institutions. And there's a reason they call us the ancient eight. Uh, you know, that, uh, the idea that uh, your stuff will be the stuff that nobody sees, you don't want to be there. Or the stuff that nobody uses, that's even worse. Thank you. Anything else or should we hop on to the next question? Looks like we're good. Okay. Podium back a little so these folks can see the panelists just back a foot. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, this one is coming at Michael. Uh, when the target demographic is everyone rather than a specific user group, how can we design services for the range of needs that they have? Okay, <laughs> uh, my, this, this question came up and this is a question that I deal a lot with uh, my previous title at NYPL was digi digital user analyst, so I spent a lot of time thinking about audiences and uh, I think NYPL is a pretty good uh, proxy for everyone uh, because we're one of the few institutions in the world, if not the only, that has um, a you know, sort of world scale uh, neighborhood branch library system that lends as well as for research libraries. Um, we literally have an audience that goes from uh, the homeless and the incarcerated through to PhD researchers and the wealthiest people in New York City and everyone in between. Um, so of course you look at that spread and you think that's everyone, um, but in fact it's not everyone. Uh, it, it, it breaks itself down into uh, a series of uses, it's a series of specifics, it's a series of uh, things that you can get your head around. Um, and it brings up a lot of different uh, approaches. Um, one approach is to identify segments within that, use any means necessary, surveys, uh, uh, you know, analytics, uh, uh, listening to social networks to find out where people are. Um, I'd made a partial list and I won't read all of these, but these are some of the uh, segments that we have identified at MYPL. Uh, professional researchers, academic scientists and business researchers, authors, editors, journalists and other writers, visual artists, performing artists, uh, business users, entrepreneurs, job seekers, employers, those seeking financial advice, those seeking business advantage, uh, readers for pleasure, genealogists, enthusiast amateurs, huge, huge audience, uh, educators, students at all levels, educators at all levels, parents of children, um, space users, people who just come in to use the building, people who came in to use the bathroom, people who came in to use the computers, people who came in for a class for a program, uh, attendees of classes, special needs audiences, um, those without computers, tourists, the list goes on. So there are things that you can get your hands around. Um, but I think the important understanding is that uh, just as the ideal of DPLA or a similar effort is to include all of the materials and let the filters evolve, um, really, uh, in hearing David Weinberger's intro, I thought about what is everything? You know, everything's the ideal, but it's not really going to be everything. It's everything we can get our hands on, which is probably going to be a very finite slice of everything. Um, and similarly, everybody is going to be a finite slice of everybody. So it's going to be a dance. It's going to be back and forth, knowing about the people who are there using, uh, but keeping in mind, uh, one of, uh, sorry, is, is it Joy's Law that, you know, all of the smartest people work for someone else? Um, yeah, there's something similar in libraries, you know, all of the best patrons are going to be going somewhere else. Um, 
So we need to think about that uh, and realize that we know who's there, but also being cognizant of who are we leaving out. Uh, that's really the big question that should be asked frequently, often, constantly. Um, did we miss anybody? Who are we leaving out? Uh, you know, we think we've got everybody, and everybody is sort of everybody we're talking to. But the reality is it's much bigger. Um, I could ramble on at this for some length, so I think I'll open it up to any other questions. <laughs> but that's, that's wonderful. The segmenting, I think, is a really, really smart way of putting it. Does anybody have anything they want to say to that? Yeah. Let me bring a microphone, too. I'm like double mic'd here. I really don't need that. <laughs> This is more of a comment rather than a magic bullet kind of answer, but listening to Nate and then to you, Michael, I keep wondering about how to cultivate DPLA as a place. You know, there's this idea of library as place. How can you make that a destination and sort of bring in sort of theoretical concepts based on that idea to make it inclusive and to get it to be a place where kids will want to go? And I don't know if user-generated content is the avenue towards that, but it might be a start. I think that's what I was getting at when I was saying make it fun, basically. Um, you, you have to make, whether, whether a place is uh, on the web or a place is a physical space, um, it's, it's a user experience question, right? And it's, it's a matter of turning it into a desirable place. And I think that is pretty much on everybody's radar. And uh, looks like Toby wants to talk about that yeah. too. Oh, well, were yeah. you, did you, was that done with your thought? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, that's something we look at with our digital media lab in terms of creating spaces for people to create content. One of the places we look at for inspiration is uh, the U Media Lab at Chicago Public Library, which is, you know, of course, one of the largest examples of these sort of spaces, as well as being the uh, most well-funded. Uh, the one of the things that we're concerned with is create in, in creating kind of a social environment for people is how do you how do you get people to be that first pioneer? You know, there's always a stigma against putting your stuff out there and no one responding, and you know, you acknowledge that you know 99% of the people on the web are never going to respond, but you know, they may actually end up seeing it. One of the things UMedia has done, uh, and again, thanks to having the funding to do to do this, is they hired mentors, people who are, you know, skilled graphic designers, or people who have are, you know, recording artists or filmmakers or things like this, who go and respond to everything that's put out there and provide this almost instant level of feedback. And that's something that we may need to look at in terms of creating this this interactive space. Is how do we how do we increase the reaction time? How do we justify, or how do we how do we make people feel justified in putting their, making their content available through our platform? Anybody else on, uh, yeah. yeah. There you go. I came in a bit late, I'm not sure if it was covered, but one of the things I find interesting about, about this and your comment about segmentation is that uh, if we are aiming for something that's an infrastructure that's networked and is potentially multi-site, um, if you recognize you have multiple segments of your audience, hopefully, you'll know you've succeeded with your network architecture if you can also easily segment the services. And we're already starting to see that, I think, with some of the large digital collections out there. I mean, books that Google scans, they're available through Google Books, they're available through Hathi Trust, um, they're available through on the online books page. And each of those three, I mean, it's a fairly general purpose collection, offers a somewhat slightly different experience of navigating these things, which some, some users may prefer o over, over others, depending on what they're interested in. But if you, you can also, you've also seen collections on specific topics of interest, which are obviously pulling off of that um, Google Books corpus, for example, or other things like that. So I'm hoping that you know, if, if this succeeds, we'll, we'll start making it easy so people can share the common information and build um, audience-targeted services toward those. Yeah, I, I, I think... Um Segmentation of the audience is, is sort of one approach, but there's the other approach, which is build the services with, in David's words, the dumbest architecture possible, because that becomes a, 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 the most flexible, and letting the audiences find the services. 
um, that's that's kind of a, a, a different approach. Um, you know, it, it's kind of occurred to me that over the years he mentioned SGML and that so so many of the uh, the big hits, so many of the networks that have succeeded have been simplifications of previous complicated networks. Uh, SGML was argued for years and then Tim Berners-Lee sort of based HTML on a very small slice of SGML and the world changed. Um, so there's, there's kind of that approach which is, uh, you know, build, it, build the network first and let the audience find. Um, if I could just uh, two seconds, uh, going back to the question about uh, 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 physical libraries. Um, when I approached this, I wrote down my notes and I, I started writing more questions. <laughs> and my next three questions were, um, is there a distinction, you know, is the distinction between digital and physical important in a national digital library? Uh, what are the boundaries of the library space? Does the boundary of the institution have meaning anymore? I think it does, topic for another time. Um, and th that idea, uh, also how loyal are the patrons, which I think is a really overlooked metric is do you have an audience that shows up every day or do they show up once a year? And I've noticed this is one of the fundamental differences between, for example, museum websites and library websites. Libraries have enormously emotionally invested loyal audiences. Um, and that's a key distinction. And museums tend to be special events. They tend to be, I'm going to visit the Met once. <laughs> Uh, and libraries, you know, my typical patron shows up at least once a week. And if you make one change on the library website, you get 150 emails. <laughs> Wouldn't know anything about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to move on to the next question here. For Jefferson, um, how do we not only maintain but actually improve the integrity and quality of digital resources and online services across many diverse memory institutions? It's a mouthful. Yes. Um, so I guess there are two pieces to it, right? Integrity and quality. Um, integrity generally being the responsibility of the data creator, data providers. Quality is more a determination of the data user. Um, so when we're talking about integrity, we're talking about structural integrity, which is file format, relational integrity, generally metadata, and ongoing integrity, which is preservation. Um, so we've been digitizing cultural heritage collections, which is more the perspective I'm coming from, um, for many years. There's tons of stuff out there, um, but I think a lot of us acknowledge that it's often institutionally contained, idiosyncratically described, and inadequately preserved. And so I think it's these last two areas, um, generally metadata and especially digital preservation, where big tent projects and collaborative initiatives um, have a really good opportunity to engage content creators and content digitizers uh, in a way that ensures integrity. Um, so we've talked about metadata and the crosswalks, um, and I think that collaborative projects definitely off offer a lot of potential there for getting smaller institutions up to speed and metadata standards. Um, but I think they also have excellent potential for digital preservation initiatives. And something like DPLA can really um, make a big difference for smaller institutions in the digital preservation realm. Um, just ideas of how they could do that. They could encourage and support uh, collaborative or consortial digital preservation networks, um, be it shared storage or locks networks. Um, they could offer repository services, um, develop open source tools for authentication and validation, uh, or even just pr provide consulting about cloud computing. And I think the MWDL and the regional hubs sort of uh, had some really good ideas around this. Um, so that's integrity. And then quality, um, we've talked about linked open data and interop interoperability and how these increase uh, accessibility, and nothing really ensures quality like use. Um, but talking about availability, it's sometimes easy to overlook the uh, existing contextualizations of digital assets uh, within their current environments. So when we're aggregating data, we're sometimes just aggregating data and not necessarily aggregating um, the curation that has already been done. Um, so I think big tent projects um, can really support like educational or, or curricular programming that's already been built upon special collections. 
Um, and it can really support a lot of sort of the contextual detail that's been provided already. Um, so what they need to do to do that, and I'm not really sure I have the answer to this, is uh, develop ways to mine the tacit knowledge that exists from content stewards and recreate it in a new environment. And I think that's both a technical problem, also a problem of um, epistemology, essentially. Um, and the idea is that we often talk about digital objects being in silos, but I think um, that we're not just trying to pull collections from silos, we're also trying to pull the programming uh, and the curricular initiatives and the education programs uh, that have been built uh, on those collections too. Um, so what are some examples of that? Uh, BPL, BPL had a great one called Brooklyn uh, Connections, which essentially worked uh, to tie students and teachers to primary source archival materials, and a lot of uh, libraries have very similar things. Um, and I think BPLA, our big collaborative efforts, uh, have a chance to sort of scale up successful local projects. Um, and then there's other projects, uh, the Library of Congress and Internet Archive do K through 12 web archiving projects, um, which is obviously a national initiative already, um, but something like DPLA has the opportunity uh, to sort of provide another means of dis dissemination. Um, so ensuring quality is not just ensuring the accessibility and use of the asset, but also ensuring that what has already been built upon that asset is also harvested. Um, so that's my spiel. Uh, any other ideas? Thoughts, anybody? It's because you nailed it. You got <laughs> it. <laughs> Hardly. <laughs> Well, there, there are lots of uh, free online tools out there. Uh, for example, the Teaching with Primary Sources um, program that Library of Congress has come up with that, uh, that teachers can use uh, to help educate students about how to use primary sources. And it provides a, a very simple tool for harvesting the resources, putting them, parking them in this uh, a file, and then adding descriptive material to it so that a teacher, for example, could um, just be building this repertoire of digital objects that she can then use in her teaching. So um, that's teaching with primary sources. It's TPS, uh, and you can get information about that at the uh, Library of Congress website. Um, and then some institutions have developed uh, pretty sophisticated tools for using uh, primary sources that have been digitized. And one of them uh, is the one that Utah State University has created called uh, Instructional Architect. Uh, and they go around the state and they teach teachers how to use this uh, to build websites of resources um, that their students can then use. Uh, so. You can just build it into a learning object or you know, just use it to uh, enhance your curriculum. Just uh, with that teaching with primary resources thing, uh, I, I want to bring it back around to the, the addition of user-generated content again because I think of um, uh, one lesson that uh, my wife does. She's a high school history teacher and uh, with an interest in art history. And um, there's a lesson that she does in which she's trying to uh, show how Japanese prints influenced Impressionism. And to, to take and build a collection of all of these things that can be looked at together is, is incredibly useful. But then to actually take it the next step and have a, have a, a student create a work of art of their own and, and add it to that collection and see how that reflects everything that's going on in there. Um, it's, it's, it's just this really exciting way of engaging, a, it's active learning, you know. Pass this along for you now. I just had a quick comment. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, I just wanted to add a quick comment that um, I was just really intrigued with, with puzzling through some of the things that David Weinberger was saying this morning about, you know, we don't need to be gatekeepers and holding back you know, on resources, that there are ways to help people with the filtering and help people to learn to interpret stuff. And so I'm just really intrigued to think about 
what that means as we start scaling up with just tons and tons of stuff and and do is is my sort of instinctive anxiety about oh my gosh there's going to be a lot of junk in there you know is that just something that we're going to learn to deal with and that's one of the new great challenges and great opportunities that that this all provides totally before i move to the next question does anybody have anything they want to jump in and say onward uh, for Sandra, what opportunities are emerging for the big tent portals repositories to present and even construct knowledge that were not available when the content was institution or domain specific? Yeah, and I think you know, we probably already have dealt with this, but I'd love to hear people's ideas. You know, we, we, we are starting to notice even at the regional level that we're working with, the Mountain West Digital Library, that the information and not it seems different when you start juxtaposing it with things that are really different the diversity brings about new thought processes new interactions with the material you know one example that cheryl and i were talking about earlier is in our part of the dry 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 west range management issues carry a lot of emotional and political weight with people we don't have a lot of water in utah so how people choose to run cattle and sheep on our public lands makes a big difference well you get a whole different set of vocabularies when you look at documents coming out of utah state's university range management program from what you get coming out of um, different political offices that are seeking to expand the use, uh, you know, expand mining and other uses on these lands from a lot, we have a large number of environmental organizations in Utah who are looking to diminish some of those destructive uses. Water plays into this, um, all kinds of things start coming to play. And when you put all those resources together, people start being able to compare them, contrast them, see the differences, and hopefully come up with new knowledge about them that wasn't available when all of it was in different silos. So any thoughts on that coming out of the earlier, earlier talk today or ideas on that? No more thoughts. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one. For Cheryl, can or should one digital library do it all? Do we need both a half a trust and a digital public library of America? Why or why not? I love this question. I really do. Um, you know, when, when I first started hearing about DPLA, I thought, why do we need another national digital library initiative? Because, you know, Hadi Trust was already underway. But um, when I started to read a little more about what DPLA was doing, and then I, I went back and I compared it to what Hadi Trust is doing, and it makes sense to me to have two different initiatives because you're serving different needs and uh, the kinds of activities that Nate is talking about, reuse, remix, and so forth, um, they're different from the kinds of needs that Hadi Trust is trying to serve where we're, uh, it's important to us to distinguish scholarly uh, resources, uh, distinguish between different editions of a given work, for example. Uh, and it's important for us to preserve these things that have, these seminal works that have been around a long time. So the emphasis in Hadi Trust is, is a lot on the preservation and the curation aspects of digital objects and, and less, a little less on the reuse and remix. Um, so I, I think they're approaching resources from different uh, perspectives. Um, but I'm really interested in hearing what the rest of you think because you could get some kind of emotional arguments in pitting these two things uh, against each other. Um, but I think rather that they can complement each other. So what do the rest of you think? Let me bring my microphone back to you, man. Thanks. Yeah, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense what you said, and I think they could ultimately meet in the middle, Hathi Trust and DPLA. So so coming from two different directions of focus and of use cases, but I think they could meet up. So I hope both organizations just stay open to meeting up, which is also yeah. uh, involves 
your technical approach. Like I could see HathiTrust providing services that DPLA could use HathiTrust content and being open to that, providing the right APIs and hooks and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes sense for there to be both. And I think, you know, who knows, in 20 years, maybe there'll be one thing or there'll be something completely different than either of those two things. But for now, they're both focusing on different stuff. But I think there's a lot of potential for them to end up meeting in the middle. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. And, and we have to keep in mind that that even if they remain two separate initiatives, that there could be a bridge built, a virtual bridge that links the two together. Um, and because you're putting your stuff in Hadi Trust, doesn't mean you can't go into DPLA and look, use their stuff. So there's gonna be a lot of uh, use for any given person of both, of both tools. Other thoughts? Here. Yeah, I, I guess my question is really, it, it seems like we're going to have a lot of these repositories. Like in, in New Jersey, we have a, a statewide um, New Jersey digital highway. Mm -hmm. And to me, these, uh, there are a lot of these that are already in place, and the question is how do you connect them? Yeah. Um, I just recently had two experiences. One, the um, 18th century journal called Spectator. Mm -hmm. We have a collection, a digitized collection. It's in Hathi Trust. Um, we're just looking at um, digitizing back issues of our Rutgers University Library Journal. Mm -hmm. It's in Hathi Trust. Uh, we're not members of Hathi Trust. And so, you know, this is really kind of a complex decision, you know, whether we should join and we should rely on Hathi Trust for a lot of these materials, whether we should do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we have, um, my perception is that we haven't worked out a policy on how to approach this. And, you know, maybe in the meantime, we need to figure out how to connect all these various repositories somehow. Mm -hmm. I, the user interface would be quite complex, I think, in the end. But um, with you, the things that you have digitized, are you satisfied with the long-term preservation uh, strategies that you're using to save these? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, sure. Sure. I, you know, I just take a lot of heart in the fact that DPLA is looking at ways to is looking at some aggregated models. Because from where I sit, I'd love to see you know, some of the more local institutions digitizing the spectator and, and other resources and then aggregating the metadata into these larger repositories mm -hmm. in various ways, in various repositories. But I agree with you, it's messy and it's probably going to continue to be messy for a while until, at least until people develop trust that wherever they're putting their stuff is going to be safe there and last there and be taken care of really well. But yeah, one of the things we've, we've appreciated with the MWDL is, is just you know, how you can, if you come up with the right technical infrastructure, you can have things be managed locally, but available centrally, which mm -hmm. I, hope, I hope DPLA will look at some of those options and its models for its infrastructure. And every institution has unique resources, uh, like the papers of Jack London, for example. There's only going to be one institution that holds that. Um, so I, I, increasingly, I think at, at our shop at Utah State University, that's one of our selection criteria is, has this been digitized already? Can, can our users get access to it already? And in that case, we, we move on to something else. Well, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I Google it. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, and, and one of the things, um, folks in Nevada have done a really good job with the help of Liz, Liz Bischoff, who many of you may know, in going around to literally hundreds of cultural heritage institutions and saying, what do you have? And is any, what of it is digitized? And what of it is, um, what if it has copyright that allows us to license this for online display, et cetera? And we've talked about maybe doing that in other parts of the Mountain West as well, because it is really helpful, as you say, to kind of start uh, being efficient, a little more efficient about this. But also the mess is going to happen too. I think you have to, have, you have to allow the mess to happen, because different thing, it leads to different interesting stuff. Nice. Uh, I think there's one more question here, so I'm going to hop to that. There are, there's more, yeah. Um, so for Toby, uh, if the lines of access and participation between the academy and the general public are blurred by a shared resource like the DPLA, what effect, if any, will this have on the nature of scholarship? Well, it occurs to me now that uh, as one of the handful of public librarians, it's, it's kind of interesting that I'm being tapped to make these sweeping generalizations about <laughs> the scholarly community. But um, that being said, I'm just going to wipe the flops, flop, flop sweat off my forehead and just plunge into it. Uh, we're talking about this, and you talk about the, the remix culture a lot and how there's this newly, there's the, the pace at which things are released and then commented upon and then and and blended and you know turned into new objects that it's become much more dramatic than it's always been and that runs and again pardon for these stereotypes uh, you know it runs counter to some of the the provincialism and some of the pace that tends to exist in the scholarly community things like you know just the the process of you know how things can take months upon months upon years to to get published and you know, the way these things move through. And we're now reaching this point to where things like a, a retweet or a Facebook share can have, can set just as many ripples through the, through the environment as, you know, something like a citation in another journal. Um, we, I, speaking as a librarian, I think we have a responsibility to not just help encourage that process, but to, to monitor it and try to find some way to archive how these trans how these transactions are taking place, and you know, having an open environment, an open linked environment, can help to to facilitate that blending, and help to kind of blur some of those lines between just sort of this, the the commentary from the general public and from from the academy. Um, but you know, as I started thinking about this, it started just leading, like Michael said, just leading to more and more questions, and um, and that's where I'm hoping I can hear some other comments from from. All of you. Let me pass you a microphone. Um, having um, been participating in sort of digital scholarly initiatives for probably um, 10 years or so now, um, well, more than that, maybe almost 15, I, what I find over and over again is you hear people talking about things like. Um, the American Memory Collection at LC. Like over and over again, scholars build digital collections that they make publicly available online, thinking that only scholars will use them, and finding that over and over again, far younger people, there's a far greater audience for what they put up there than they ever thought. Uh, Edward Ayers at the University of Virginia put up, you know, this um, Salem witch, or, well, Edward Ayers did, did the Civil War thing, but there was also a, civil, uh, a Salem witch trial site um, and they found that, you know, oh, we were thinking only scholars would use this, but you put it online, it's just sort of the easiest way to make it available to all scholars, but the public just, you know, latches onto it. I mean, from what I understand, you know, high schoolers never used to get to work with primary sources, never. It is so common now in, in schools for, people, you know, for students to get to work with, at the very least, they get to see images. Uh, you know, primary sources images, and then often that leads to, you know, like a field trip to go work with those primary sources. So, um, and, you know, I, I put up, you know, my scholarship, my sort of like arcane specialist scholarship on the Villanelle, you know, an originally 16th century poetic form, and I get emails, you know, about that from people who are not in the academy, who are just interested, and it's, it's always remarkable. So I'm, I'm all about this. I think this is a good thing. A, a shared resource like the DPLA, a se shared sort of semi-centralized resor resource, I think will have the effect of, of trickling scholarship down. You know, mm -hmm. that's good. 
Yeah, and just a quick follow on to Amanda's point. Um, this doesn't really have to do with scholarship, but uh, I come from a user experience background, an information architecture background, and it's kind of become a truism with teams I've worked with that if you design tools for the advanced user, you don't benefit the novice user. But if you design for the novice user, you benefit the advanced user. Because advanced tools have been conflated sometimes with difficult to use, and it's not true, people. Um, experts don't like to have tools that are difficult to use any more than the beginners do. They want them to be more powerful, but not more difficult to use. So I think what we're seeing is as we learn more about how to design digital discovery tools for a general audience, those benefits trickle down to an academic and elite audience. So true that uh, uh, the laws of simplicity, you ever read that book? That I never know how to say that guy's name, John Media. Yeah. Anyways, good stuff. If I may, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, just on a similar note and uh, kind of tying into what you were saying, I, uh, our keynote speaker cited Clay Shirky and another one of his ideas that I, that I fully subscribe to is this idea that things don't become technologically or don't become socially interesting until they become technologically boring. And you know, by focusing our priorities on creating a space that gives you know, the casual observer is something, you know, a much richer level of content to, to comment on and interact with and, and, you know, discover lots of new kind of serendipities gives the academic environment far more material to work with. And, you know, I think it's a priority for all of us involved with this project to do something to facilitate both sides of that. Yes. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I have to move on real quick here, but it's Right back to you, Toby. Oh. Uh, in politics, the critics of big tent parties argue that they alienate the ideological base of the party and diminish participation. In collaboratively raising a big tent digital library, what, if anything, do we stand to lose? Well, this, it's, this is another question that just raises more questions. I think we're, if we're in a space where the model that's being created here tends to rattle a lot of the, the existing structures, whether it's with the traditional publishing environment or the, you know, there, in public libraries, there's a certain provincialism. You know, we pride ourselves on having strong local understandings, but oftentimes, you know, that, that's taking into account the, the object exists, you know, just as a fixed point. It doesn't go out and, ex you know, the possibility of it having a connection to another to another community is you know there's there's a collective ignorance about that and so I guess there's a yeah I, I guess the risk is how do we do this without losing the interest of the people who already have a stake in here um, and, and you know what questions what other questions are going to emerge from from that. Okay, and I hate to just like cruise through this, but we're running out of time, so I'm going to just jump to the next question. Do you want to yield um, my time? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, how can public libraries best contribute their greatest resource, the attention and creative efforts of their patrons and staff, to a national digital library, Michael? Okay. Um, well, uh, di uh, a digital public library. Um, has to be designed from the outset to be uh, this your, your read-write concept to go both ways. Um, I think in the history of uh, digital repositories and librarianship to this point has been about the collection. It's, it's first it's digitize the catalog then it's digitized, so it's, you're digitizing the pointers to objects. That now it's been digitizing the objects. Um, and as David Weinberger said in the keynote, it's sort of that, that idea of the conversation around things can actually have more value than the things themselves. It's, it's uh, the, you know, the, 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 the original object will kind of take care of itself, but the inner relationship between things is really the key. Um, a lot of this is in network architecture, again, the idea of the very simple network architecture. Unique identifiers for everything, you know, unique identifiers for 
uh, for, for people so that, so that their comments and their links and their attributions and their creations can be uh, sort of shared and tracked along with them. Um, but this idea of APIs and openness, uh, all of these things are going to contribute to uh, a, a network that can go uh, both ways, where we can uh, re really, you know, the social network layer is no longer something that gets, you know, buttered on the bread at the end of the process anymore. I think it, in, in 2011, uh, the conception of, of a national digital library has to have as part of the infrastructure, sharing and contribution and a two-way conversation and a very easy democratic way to get materials into the system. And that should get easier over time. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. And uh, I could not agree that. more. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that's really well said. I kind of hate that we have to end this now. Um, but we are at time. I think that, you know, if you guys are on Twitter and you want to continue this conversation there, I think that I know I'm going to be looking back at it uh, as well. Thank you all for, uh, for your contributions to this conversation. This has been really great. Oh, sorry. And this is us. Yeah. <laughs>